Today's edition of Mysterious Matters is brought to you by K&N Engineering. K&N Engineering is the manufacturer of reusable automotive and motorcycle replacement filters. Their air filters are designed to increase horsepower and acceleration while providing outstanding engine protection. This simple to install air filter is backed by the K&N Million Mile Limited Warranty and will be the last air filter your vehicle will ever need. Go to knfilters.com slash podcast and get an absolutely amazing deal on a K&N replacement air filter with free shipping. And as a bonus, you will also get a free hat. From Nashville, Tennessee, this is Mysterious Matters. For those who dare to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the program. Our guest this evening is Ian Punnett. And the topic of the night is a black night for the Bluegrass Bell, the murder of Verna Gar Taylor, and the Kentucky Honor Code killing that gave her justice. And we will be discussing a lot of different topics and not just Ian's book, But if after listening to this program you are interested in reading A Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell, you can go to mysteriousmatters.com slash black knight. That is mysteriousmatters.com slash black knight. Well, with that said, let's welcome Ian onto the program. And without further ado, Ian, welcome back. (laughs) If only they knew all the stuff we were talking about just before the show started. (laughs) Well, let me reverse this. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm I'm going to be welcoming on two individuals, two people that you've probably heard their voices before. First of all, let's welcome Ian Case. Ian? Uh, Yeah, so I don't even know how to do Ian Case anymore, but that was was originally started off on top 40 radio stations, and then I I slid over and I used that name on... uh, on on hard rock and heavy metal radio stations when I hosted morning radio for about 20 years. And so I had a good time being Ian Case. It was a lot easier for people to to pick up than Ian Punnett. But when I went, when I got into talk radio, that's when I slid into the I went back to the my birth name. Case is actually my legal first name. My 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 real name is Case Ian Punnett. But oh, no one really? Ever, yeah. No one ever called me that. I was always Ian Case Punnett. And so I dropped Punnett when I did top 40 and then rock. And then when I got into talk, I thought it's a good step forward to just going back to being who I really am. And that's Ian Punnett. So I I wish I could do Ian Case for you, but you'd have to be either like playing a song. I'd have to be talking up a a jingle uh, about the, you know, the the uh, the the weather in Nashville. (laughs) Or I'd have to be doing something to bring out the Ian Case part. I, 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 I don't even know quite how that would sound yet. It would probably scare me, probably scare everybody. Well, let me try something. I saw something on YouTube. Let me tell you, Ian, country music is bigger than rock and roll. It is uh, <laughs> number one in the world. <laughs> well, yeah, so you're referring to this video that floats around about me confronting the guy who was the program director of uh, WSM at the time. And he was a super nice guy to to agree to come on to 103 KDF, Nashville's home of pure rock and roll. A little slipped out. Um and uh, or Nashville's rock and roll station. I can't remember. Wait, no, it was Nashville's rock and roll station. That's yes. what it was. And um, that was the other one was 97X, the Quad Cities home of pure rock and roll. That was that was that was the Quad Cities. And then the other one was Y107, Mammoth and Ocean County's hit music connection. Before that, and then I can't even remember all the other radio stations but sure so he came on and kevin came on and and he was so fun to just banter back and forth about country music although this is kind of be this is while country started to get cool again so in a lot in a lot of ways i sort of lost that battle because country kept stealing licks from rock Mm -hmm. and especially from the eagles and from kind of that whole southern california sound which garth brooks appropriated so well and 
And so, you know, country music changed during that period. And we said goodbye to to Kenny and Dolly and Porter and all of the other former big names. And we brought in there was a whole really a, during that period of the early 90s, country music changed forever. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not a fan of today's country music because it's more like rock and roll in the 70s or rock and roll in the 80s. It's true. It's just like you said, the, the country music of the past, it's doesn't exist anymore, not unless you go to record collections or CDs or whatever. Uh, there's a few of the new ones I really like, you know, so I I have to swallow some of my own words when it comes to uh, like Alan Jackson, Good Times. That's a great song. Mm -hmm. And it's got enough of the old country vibe to it, but it's also it's just a fun, good boot scooting kind of song. So I there's a, there's a, I have a list of about 10 country songs I can listen to at any time. I did a huge spit take listening to that uh, video, especially when you asked Kevin if Randy Travis was gay. I did a huge spit take. <laughs> something about, yeah, about Randy Travis marrying his mother or something, because the woman he was married to was his uh, was his. Uh, it was his manager. Yeah, his manager. And she was significantly older than he was. Yeah. And they got divorced several years ago and then he got remarried. And I guess it was last year. Right. So I can't remember what the conversation about, but I can pretty much guarantee you it was obnoxious and I was probably poking him with a stick trying to get him to, to say something on my rock station <laughs> that he would regret. But that was, that's the nature of morning rock radio, that's for sure. Yeah. So, Ian, uh, a lot of people would be interested in this. How did you get from being a DJ of sorts, especially here in Nashville, to hosting a nationally syndicated program like Coast to Coast AM? Well, I, there was a, and if anybody's interested, and I, I, I'm grateful, I, it was a fun period for me. I loved doing morning rock radio, and I did morning radio in one form or another for many years after that. But I dropped um, the music piece, and I, I became sort of a morning talk show host during the week, and then I did, on the weekends, I was doing more of a straight talk kind of presentation. And what happened was in Atlanta, I was given the opportunity to fill in for Art Bell because the company I was working for at the time, which was j -Corps Communications, they bought – later they would become Clear Channel, but j -Corps bought Premier, the Premier Radio Networks, which at the time really just had two shows on it that they wanted and then the rest – I think they gave back to the, the guy who sold it to them. But one of the shows they wanted was, was definitely Art Bell, which was hot. And they, he, he, the story goes that Art, up until that point, whenever he took the show, was on seven nights a week, and that's a lot for anybody to do. Mm -hmm. And Art pre-recorded one of them, and I think did the other six live, and that was kind of killing him. And so, when any time he would take a night off, he would put on some of his friends, and some of them were very good. Um, Hilly Rose is a good example of that, a veteran broadcaster did a really good radio show, maybe a little older than the average listener, but still a good radio guy. And and some of them weren't so good. And it drove j -Corp crazy because they thought there was a lot of amateurs. So they were looking for people within the company that could host a show like that and not have a big political agenda because almost all of their all of their talk show hosts were really driven by politics and that was never my thing. So that was how I got – and then because I'd been to college and because I was actually – I think I was in grad school at the time already and they thought I might be smart enough to figure out some of these topics that Art talks about. And they were challenging and I think that's how I got it was that basis alone. OK. Let me ask you this. When Art quit – I don't know which time this was and Premier Radio brought in Mike Siegel, I believe his name was. It was. Why didn't they – well, actually, let me reverse myself. Did they offer that position to you first? Never did. Never did. It was reported that way, though, which was funny because Drudge reported it that way. And I was like, well, that's news to me because I already knew Mike Siegel had the thing. I They really liked his voice, and he was a very professional sound. He had a great voice. And it, court, it sort of took that piece of the Art Bell experience, the, a kind of a throaty, late-night kind of a, you know, ominous toned guy. And it, it, they, they were hoping, I think, to continue that. Um, but they, they had me fill in a ton. 
I don't even remember if they even talked to me about it. Honestly, I don't think I was even mm. in contention, which was funny to me when I saw it pop up on Drudge that I got in the gig. I was like, that's news to me. But yeah, it's funny. I, I think I printed that out and saved it for years. Personally, I was hoping that you were going to be the main guy, that you were going to take over because outside of art, you were my favorite host of Coast to Coast. Well, you're nice to say that, but I will tell you, it would have been a mistake. It would have been a mistake. It would have been a mistake because Mike, it's, for better or for worse, Mike inspired art to get back in the game. It, it was art's show. I mean, it, you know, he was the quarterback. He created the league in a way. So anybody that was going to be in that chair was going to be subject to art wanting to come back or not. And I don't I, I stepped aside for him on other occasions as well. And then I filled in for him when he left without much warning. And I, I came back and did that too. I was happy to do it either way. He was the master. So it would have been, that would have been hard for me, maybe even. And I don't think, I, I think if Art wanted to get back into it, anybody would have been wise to step aside for Art. Let me ask you this. There was another gentleman here in the Nashville area. He died, I guess, two or three years ago. His name was Teddy Bart. Did you ever have the opportunity to, to meet him? Yeah, we did. We He was, you know, Teddy Bart was part of a previous generation of well-known media personalities in Nashville. And he was definitely on the personality side. I mean, his name was sort of synonymous with with hosting. Uh, and it could be radio, it could be TV. He just had that kind of a presentation that um, he was he was accessible. And a lot of people, he had a lot of fans. Um, at the time that I was on the air on 103 KDF, in the 90s, he was a little bit more of a punchline for us, not because he did anything to deserve it, mind you, but because <laughs> he sort of represented that older sound of 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 a previous broadcasting generation. So we would we might throw his name in there if we were trying to use the name of somebody that was emblematic of radio or TV of uh, uh, of the past, even though he wasn't. He was very much a player mm -hmm. when I there and and well deserved so i mean anybody we made fun of on 103 kdf back when i was there and it was a rock station none of them deserved it <laughs> i mean they were we, we were all just being you know kids in the back row throwing spit wads <laughs> yeah and teddy was very helpful for me when i was getting into podcasts there were several people who were helpful you teddy bart and even to a degree, Art Bell has been helpful in a gentleman by the name of Cliff Ravenscraft. He's called the Podcast Answer Man. Yeah, I've heard about him. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. And and I will tell you, you know, Teddy Bart deserved that. He, I always heard good things about him personally. One thing I did not know about Teddy Bart was that prior to Art Bell starting Coast to Coast AM, Teddy Bart was actually doing a similar show in 1987 called, I think it was Beyond Reason, but it just never took off. Well, that's the thing that if you really, I mean, in a lot of ways, and if we were talking about Coast to Coast and Art Bell, and I'm sure Art wouldn't like to hear me say this, but in a lot of ways, Art caught lightning in a bottle. He was the right guy at the right time doing the right show in the right mood at the right time of day. I mean, it was just, it was perfect. It, the planets, if you pardon the expression, lined up just right. And then – because up until that point, there really had been a few shows like that on the overnight that had been attempted, some of which had gone on for years. But it had been a long time. Mm -hmm. And so it just happened to be, I think, at a time when people were becoming bored of the – mainstream media had become extremely predictable. It still is in many ways. And so Coast to Coast came along in this sort of insidious way, which was just great, it's very subversive. And and the, it captured that counterculture necessity that had been kind of low hanging fruit for a while, and people wanted it. And now, you know, after within a couple of years of doing Coast to Coast, of course, there's a million other shows that follow in the same vein. A lot of TV product, a lot of big budgets. At the time, it was really art. Art owned all of it, and and he was he deserves credit for that. But I think even he would tell you that he knows there were many more people that did it before he did. When it comes to radio or podcasting, it's very saturated, almost every field. What field or what genre do you think is the uncharted territory, if there is one? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so we're talking about different platforms. And I think audio is still not respected enough. And I think the people who are doing the heavy lifting and podcasting like you, I think you are 
generating a lot of fans. I, I know for a fact, I'll say Brandy Tilton sent me a message saying, when are you going to do Mysterious Matters? So I, there's you have a lot of fans out there, and it, it's just the kind of lifestyle media that people need that you can pick it up, you can put it down, it fits what you want. It, it is doing what Netflix is doing to television. Podcasts have been doing all along, which is I've got 35 minutes to drive from point A to point B. Oh good, that's my chance to hear my favorite show. And that's so much different than turning on a turnkey radio station, which runs like a, almost like a, a public utility, right? Like a faucet, you turn on radio, broadcast radio and it's like turning on the faucet water comes out you put it in your glass you drink it you turn off the faucet that's it and in podcasting it's it's really not that way at all it's it's like having a microwave dinner you can take it to work you got your break you pop it in you enjoy it you get back to work it lives on your schedule and so more and more anything that comes along will still have to fit that and that kind of uh that that's what's changed forever and i think that you'll just find easier platforms for people to be able to do that with. Definitely. One thing I've been hearing from a lot of people is that they prefer listening to my program now versus Coast to Coast AM for one reason or another. Would that be because Coast to Coast AM is now more corporate controlled versus the time when Art Bell was really popular in the 90s? But remember, these people forget it was a very brief period of time when art wasn't quote unquote corporately controlled. I mean, the corporation, j came in in 96 or 7. So that wasn't that long into the history. And before that, Art didn't own the show even before that. So somebody else owned it. I mean, they in the sense that he he didn't pay for the satellite time. It was another guy who was putting the nickel down, like McMasters, I can't remember his name. Mm -hmm. um, and he was the one who kind of owned it before then. I don't think anybody interferes with Coast to Coast. I don't think it has. It, it seems like it, it might maybe to some or some people like it now more than they did then or less now than they did. That. It, that'll that'll go and come and go depending on to whom you speak. But it really doesn't have nobody. People used to say that to me all the time. Oh, you probably got your memo today of what you're supposed to say tonight. It's like, <laughs> God, I wish I was getting some show prep. <laughs> it would be nice if somebody were doing it for me. But it never happened that way, ever. And I never I never heard from anybody other than the, my producers. And they might tell me, yeah, I wouldn't do that again. Or, yeah, do that again. Who cares? Nobody was – we were all in charge. And I would get – I'd get in trouble for some of the bumpers I would play, mm -hmm. which were off the script. <laughs> we just felt like being pirates. So we would just, you know, we would play some heavy metal tune or something as a bumper. And and we would just laugh like idiots. You know, we would just be off the air just kind of like, this is so great. But I knew I'd hear about it on Monday. But it was never from the corporation. It was always just whoever my boss was at the time. You know, it was pretty harmless. Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't think that, I don't think corporations really have anything to do with it. I'd be surprised. I'd be stunned, actually, if uh, George Norrie or anybody coast to coast ever heard from anybody in the corporation. Yes. I, uh, I I was hard a time or two on George, but as I began doing my own show, I began to realize that nothing is perfect. It's easy to be an armchair host, if you will, and you're always saying to yourself, oh, I could do better. He should do better. He's doing a bad job at whatever. But until you're actually in front of the microphone, you don't have a single clue as to what goes on behind the microphone. I will tell you this, you know, say what you like and everybody's, every, you know, everything we do, what we're doing right now, everything we do is a trade off. We make a decision. We go, we decide this is the direction we're going to go in. Let's have some fun. Let's see if this works. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes it does. And sometimes it doesn't. Everything in radio is a trade off and everybody's a program director. Everybody. And they, and they have that right to decide that for themselves. But I would still stack up. George Norrie's opening 20 minutes. I love his opening 20. I love the way he goes right into news stories. He's got four callers lined up. He's got newsmakers to comment. He's got people to reflect. I just, I love that chunk. It's, it's an honor. I love following that too, because I know as a listener, that's a, that's a high tune in time because you get a lot for that brief period of time, I think. And uh, I wish I could be at the caliber of George Norrie. I, 
I used to say George Nori sucked or whatever, but as a broadcaster, as a podcaster, you look at someone like that and then you listen to yourself and you just wonder, will I ever reach that caliber? Yeah. Will I yeah. ever reach the caliber of a neon punnet or an arc bell? Yeah. We should all suck so much. Yes, that is true. <laughs> we should all suck so bad is to be George Nori. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's his own direction. It's his own show now. But when you think about it, in 2018, George will have been doing the show for 15 years. Art only did it for 10. Drop the mic. I mean, it, that's a tribute in and of itself. And it's not 15 years because they couldn't find somebody else. It was 15 years because it was working. And lots of people like the show. And is it the same? No, but it wouldn't be the same with anybody else doing it. And somebody, there would be pluses and minuses to everybody's hosting. So I'm I'm glad to hear you're reformed on that because I, you know, it's tough to follow a legend and art is definitely that. Uh, but it, um, sometimes people can remember things better than the, the way they really were too. Mm -hmm. and, and I count on that because if they don't remember me better than I actually was, I've got nothing. So I count on, I count on the, on nostalgia, creating a halo effect <laughs> around my past material. Yes. Uh, we're about to get into your book. Well, I got one other question for you. And that is if you were a teenager, if you were maybe 19, 20, when podcasting was picking up, would you still get into broadcasting or would you be a podcaster? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So I tell people all the time, maybe this will answer your question. Maybe it won't. I went to a high school that had a radio station. So I started broadcasting when I was 14. If I hadn't had that, I would have done, I definitely would have done podcasting. I got to be on the air at 14. I got to have a weekly show. I got to find out how terrible I was. I got my first professional job right after I graduated high school. Don't ask me why. And I was a professional broadcaster starting in, that was my summer job between high school and college. And, and I was awful. So yes, I would have done, I would have gone anywhere and done anything that would have allowed me to explore that. I just happened to luck out and find some people that were silly enough to pay me for it. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I would be doing. And I tell people all the time when they ask me, they say, you know, I'd really like to get into radio. And I say, oh, are you podcasting? They're like, no, 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 I want to get into radio. I'm like, why are, are you, you're like feeling like you're standing on the corner of Hollywood and Vine waiting to be discovered. Don't start tomorrow, do 10 podcasts and then come back to me and tell me whether you still feel like doing it. Because as you know, it's not your first podcast. It's not even your fifth. It's like your 50th. That's when you know whether you really have it inside you or not. Because radio every day is, is lather, rinse, repeat every day. It is shampooing every day. And there just aren't, you, you're not allowed to skip. And that's where you, you have to build an audience by repetition and by always presenting new material. And that's what podcasting allows you to do. And people that think that radio is some different experience, it's not. It's exactly the same thing, except you're much more in control of your own destiny than I think you would be if you were going to some small radio station somewhere. You'd have a lot more rules and a lot of other people telling you what to do. Mm -hmm, most certainly. And ladies and gentlemen, Ian has a book out, a new book by the name of A Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell, The Murder of Verna Gar Taylor and the Kentucky Honor Code killing that gave her justice. Ian, at the very beginning of your book, you discuss, uh, what was it, a lady in blue that was haunting uh, a hotel in... Sealbach Hotel in downtown, downtown Louisville. The hotel, the Sealbach is now called the Sealbach Hilton. And at the time when it was built, it was, it's really, and it is still an amazing hotel if no one's ever, it's still, it's still one of the most beautiful, the Rathskeller, which is in the basement is, was built just almost like inch for inch in a famous Bavarian uh, club. It, everywhere you go in the Seelbach, it's got these special corners and it, it was a marvelous hotel. It was the finest hotel for States around when it was built. And in 19... 36, a woman went down the elevator shaft to her death. Uh, and the, the story at the time linked the former lieutenant governor of Kentucky to her death. Uh, and the governor's name was Lieutenant General Henry H. Denhart. And he was a 
He was the sitting adjutant general of the Kentucky National Guard. He was a drinker. He was belligerent. He was not a considered a good person. Later on, he would be often referred to as the most hated man in Kentucky. He was known for being centrally involved in the horror that was what's called Bloody Harlan in Harlan County, Kentucky, um, and breaking up a labor strike in Newport, Kentucky, which is up closer to Cincinnati, and in the most excessive ways, completely unnecessary violence that he seemed like he felt like he had a right to do. And and that's why it fits his demeanor that he would be seen that night in the hotel when the woman went down the elevator shaft and and he was known to frequent brothels. So that part isn't so surprising. The the sad part being that if it's true that her spirit still haunts the hotel, it, it gets linked to that night that she was very likely wearing a blue slip when somebody forced her between the safety gates of the elevators. You remember elevators back then didn't really have opening and closing doors. They just had this gate that would lock and, and somebody pried it open. The, you know, the, the, the police could never identify it as being Denhart's, but later on they came back to making it seem as though definitely he had done it. And, and she went down the elevator shaft, died a very slow death after sustaining terrible injuries mm. and she's still seen around the hallways of the Seelbach hotel. And I recount several of the encounters there at the beginning of the book, uh, a black night for the bluegrass bell. And it sets the tone for what happened to my grandmother's first cousin, which is Vernegar Taylor and a very notorious murder case in the state of Kentucky, which is what this true crime book is about. What was the actual connection between the person who fell down this elevator shaft and your grandmother's first cousin? So here's the interesting piece. So the lady in blue is often seen in and around the elevators. And then there's certain rooms that she has been seen in, in the reflection of the mirror. It, it certainly, if we accept the notion of ghosts as being people who can't accept their demise and that they're they're trapped somewhere in some time dimension if that's true then she would seem to be a pretty much of an archetype of that because her her death was brought about very likely by this guy lieutenant general henry denhart who then shortly thereafter started dating uh, a 40-year-old widow named Vernegar Taylor. She lived in LaGrange, Kentucky. Denhart had just moved out that way. Uh, and he had bought a gentleman's farm after being retired from politics. I say that meaning he didn't quit. He just he couldn't get elected to anything anymore. And he had run friends that were willing to give him jobs. So he had, he had decided to, to get a, a gentleman's farm where he would – lease out the the fields to somebody else. And he started calling on Vernegar Taylor, who was an independently wealthy woman. I say wealthy in the context of uh, the depression. She owned her own business. She owned her own house. She owned a car. She had a phone in the house. She had two daughters, 20 and 17 at the time. Uh, and she had not dated at all since the death of her husband about five years earlier. She was very much in love with with Barkley Taylor, Bark, as, as he was known. And after she decided she would not accept Denhart's marriage proposal, the night she tried to give him back the ring that he had given her to think it over with, uh, that night she was found dead. Um, one shot from Denhart's 45 revolver as a service revolver in 1917, Smith and Wesson, uh, the, a particular gun that was issued to him when he served in world war one and one bullet pierced her heart, mm. came the other side and he claimed Denhart claimed it was suicide. Uh, that would have meant because when they found her body, she was clutching her gloves in her left hand that she would have had to have shot herself through her left side on an upward trajectory uh, using her right hand. 
it doesn't make any sense. It's not even physically possible. I, I have a replica of the gun. And the and then he was put on trial for that because people just didn't accept his explanation. And after there was a hung jury, and this gets to the answer of your question, um, the after there was a hung jury and they decided they were going to retry him, Jefferson County, which is where Louisville is, decided to resurrect the case of the lady in blue. And they decided to – at the time, there was a, a process where you could sue somebody for murder. And he was going to be sued for the death of the woman that went down the elevator shaft. And so that case comes back to him later on um, after people were so outraged that he got a hung jury in his – uh, murder case against my grandmother's first cousin, um, then Jefferson County came back and added another charge in an attempt to get him for that one too. But he wouldn't live long enough to be tried for, for either one a second time. Was Den Hart uh, targeting certain types of women that you know, such as uh, particularly widows? It's a good question. And so they both were widows, interestingly enough. The prostitute was too, um, although she had already divorced her husband or she was in the process of divorcing him. Uh, he had been killed in a mysterious car accident a couple of weeks before her death. But was it because they were both widows? I think part of it is probably because it was the depression. And and he was a narcissist sociopath. There have been a couple of former Coast to Coast guests that I turned to for advice on this book. And Catherine Ramsland is one of them, forensic psychologist, great writer and you know prolific writer of books about this type of serial killer behavior. And and then I also turned to a friend, Dr. Les Carter, who'd been on Coast to Coast a couple of times with me, who is an expert on narcissist sociopathic personalities. And and he labeled Trump, I'm sorry, Trump. he labeled he labeled Denhart exactly that, a narcissist sociopathic personality. And he said, and this part was the really compelling part, that, that they prey on people, women especially, they do very well with, because they come on really big. And so here's the depression. He comes on very boisterously, flamboyantly, very successful, and he has a way of, of using that to overcome people and to get women especially probably – to give into his will. And he thought, I think he targeted Verna Gar Taylor thinking she was a widow, she was very attractive, and he'd be able to have her way with him, uh, have his way with her, sorry, and and she wouldn't go along with it. And I think that's a big part of the reason why she died that night is uh, the medical examiner said there was evidence of a sexual assault. Mm. And I think she rejected him and I don't think he took that well. Yeah, he, he definitely comes across as the type of person who either he will get his way or if he doesn't get his way, he's going to have a huge fit, kind of like Donald Trump, who you just briefly mentioned, then backtrack. I didn't mean to. <laughs> Slipped out. But it's interesting how they, they do share, especially as politicians, perhaps, you know, they share a lot of traits. And I do, I will make this point. When I was writing about Denhart, back when I was putting some of the finishing touches on the book was right about the time that Trump somewhat surprisingly said, I could shoot anybody on the street. I could shoot somebody in the face or whatever he said, I'll shoot somebody dead on fifth Avenue and I wouldn't lose any votes. And that's so much like the way Denhart thought too. And they just that idea of, I have the entitlement. I'm so popular. Look at what I can do. And that's kind of how narcissist sociopaths think. Now, I, don't, I wasn't trying to start a big political fight here, but that was interesting. It's also interesting to note that O.J. Simpson, when he was arrested and they first said, well, he said, what am I being accused of? They said, for the death of Nicole Brown Simpson. And he said, and I quote, I couldn't have killed her. I loved her too much. That is exactly what Denhart said when they found Vernegar Taylor's body outside of LaGrange, Kentucky in a ditch, shot once through the heart, and Denhart, everybody was looking at Denhart, and he said, I could not have done that. I loved her too much. You know I did, which is such a bizarre thing to say. Uh, but that was that began the investigation. He thought 
all he had to do as former lieutenant governor and adjutant general is just say, I didn't do it, and nobody would investigate, but they did. And there was plenty of evidence that he did kill her, and that's why they had a trial. Thing is, when a person says they love somebody too much to kill them, that usually means that I love them too much and they were leaving me, so I had to do something because I wasn't going to lose them. That's yeah. what it says to me. Yeah, it's very interesting. And, of course, the narcissist sociopathic personality is very fragile because they, they have to work very hard at maintaining a self-image. And anything that pierces that self-image um, is a real threat. And so being being dumped, being rejected, um, being mocked, and in the case, I think, of the night, which is the core thing, you know, everything in – this book, A Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell, kind of revolves around that night. Uh, I think that night she was going to tell her brothers, um, uh, Doc, Roy, and Jack, she was going to tell her brothers that Denhart had attempted to sexually assault her. And I think he hated that idea, that that knowledge would survive the night. And I think that's part of why he killed her too, was to prevent her from getting that story out. And he's right. I, I think he had a lot to fear if if Doc and Roy and Jack knew about the assault on Verna, uh, it, it wouldn't have gone well. So all these pieces of information, all these pieces of the puzzle, they are the catalyst to murder. As they often are, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's as true that night in 1936 as it is in 2016. We just celebrated, in the darkest way possible, the 80th anniversary of that. Mm. Um I, I laid a wreath for her on the on the exact spot where her body was found, almost to the hour that she was killed. And and that's what to me that's part of what makes this book so special is this is family, and this story has never been told right up until now. It's not a parlor game. You know, some people look at it is one of the oldest, most discussed murder stories in Kentucky, but it's not. You know, this isn't some BBC production, right? This isn't to me. This isn't Mrs. Marple. This is this was real, mm -hmm. and it, it affected generations of that family. I mean, I, I just felt like the story had to be told correctly once and for all. Yeah, it is your family. You've been listening to the story for many years. I guess ever since you were a child, right? Yeah, I mean, we went to bed singing the Gar song, which was written about this tragedy it it was performed on the on the stage of the old Ryman Auditorium not too far from you over there just off uh right just off uh second app or what's yeah what's where, where's the Ryman Auditorium suddenly I can't remember the address anymore oh, I don't know I well, don't remember it's, <laughs> yeah so it, it, you know down it, but there in downtown Nashville it uh it's a they they sang the gar ballad on the stage of the Grand Ole Opry and it was about this this night. I, have, have, you've never heard. Can I sing a little bit for you? Sure, go ahead. So it's a. It was to it was to the old bluegrass tune of Jesse James, which is a great ballad. But it, it was rewritten to reflect the story of what happened to to Verna, and goes something like this. Oh, the harvest moon was shining on the streets of Shelbyville, when General Henry Denhart met his fate. For the Gar boys was a waitin', and they was armed to shoot to kill. And Death and General Henry had a date. For pretty Verna Gar was a layin' in her grave in LaGrange, just sixteen miles away. And folks from miles around say the General shot her down, because she wouldn't let him have his way. And it goes on from there to talk about that night. And uh, and it was it still haunts the family. But we used to sing it all the time because because it means standing up for kin. You know, even when you put your own life at risk, which is what her brothers did later on when Denhart continued to be a threat. And if I remember from reading your book, there were pieces of evidence left at the crime scene that Denhart claimed that, yes, he had something similar, but that individual piece was not his, even though it, it was exactly like something he had been the owner of. Is that right? Yeah, well, there's a couple of things like that, that sort of falls in that category. He, he, had, he hired a dream team of lawyers, and this is all – it's so interesting to see, again, the parallels with the O.J. Simpson case. 
um, you know, here he was a very big personality. He was well known in the media, uh, and and he was able to assemble some of the the best known legal minds designed to obfuscate a jury to 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 force the state prosecutors to do their job, which is to present the evidence that convicts somebody beyond a reasonable doubt. It can't blame them for that. I mean, the, the state is obligated. But they they also had a way of, of when they put Denhart up on the stand, he would deny anything. And he would just tell he perjured himself complete. He we know he perjured himself because even in the lawyer's own notes, which I found uh, thanks to the Filson, thanks to Filson Historical Society in in Louisville, the lawyer's notes are preserved for this case, and they know that he had already told two or three different versions of that night, and he would shape his story depending on what was being asked of him. He would completely deny anything. So even that part I told you about when he said, um, he would, the, when he was first asked. Um, when this is very interesting, right? So the very first time that somebody said, "Well, Vern is missing," he spoke about her in the past tense. He said, "She was the finest woman I ever knew." Hmm. He knew she was dead. Everybody else was like, "Well, we got to go find her." Oh, yes, very sad. She was the finest woman I ever knew, and and then late, I mean, five or six people heard him say that, and later on when he was on trial, he completely denied it. Then part of what you're referring to are things like, you know, his keys, a flashlight. Other things were found further up the road from where he was, and yet he would just deny it. He would say, no, 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 no that didn't happen. And and then the most importantly was the presence of, of what was called a pistol gun. And it was a pen pistol, um, and this pen pistol gun was could only fire one shot. And and that was part of what is wrapped up into the story that night. Uh, Lee, it's complicated to explain, but I think people will enjoy reading about it. And he, at any other time in his life, would talk about how he always, wherever he went, he always brought one with him. You know, this one-shot pen pistol that he would bring with him anywhere he went except that night, which he denied having it with him that night. And that's yet what everybody heard um, so I'll I'll leave that for the people who read the book. But it, I think it's part of what makes the story so interesting is he was wily, he was clever, and he knew he had to cover his tracks. Mm -hmm. Do you also think that that's a characteristic of a narcissistic uh, psychopath that they're going to deny everything? That they will go out, they could be recorded, say something, and then the next day deny ever saying it because we know for a fact the president-elect has also been exactly the same way. Well, and so again, not to make it a political thing, but it's it's a very consistent aspect of some people's personalities that truth is just expedient. Truth is what you decided is that day. That's true for a lot of politicians, right? I mm -hmm. mean, we they are they're caught on tape saying something exactly. There's only one possible way to interpret what they're saying, and then they say, nope completely wrong. <laughs> or they say, I never said that. And then they play the tape and then they turn it into a different conversation of, I can't believe you're playing that at a time like this. Da, da, da. You know, they, they'll, they'll do anything but to admit that they've been busted. And and I think that's definitely the case of, of, of Denhard. Truth was expedient. Um, it, it, he is the center of the merry-go-round and all the rest of us are just carved wooden horses. We don't really matter. He's all that mattered, Denhart. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think he'd killed once, he'd killed twice. And I think when Verna's brothers denied him the opportunity to perjure himself a second time, uh, as we like to say in the family, uh, I, I think he would have murdered a third time too. He, he certainly wasn't going to learn that lesson. He kept getting away with it. During your research for A Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell, I know you just mentioned that he might have killed a third time if he were not stopped. But did you find any evidence that he might have committed other murders that was never pointed to him? Okay, so this is a, I think this is a great question. I, I, I could not find any proof of it. But what I found was, and I think what's very consistent, is perhaps the ramp up 
to where we were. And if we we go back to discussing, like he was involved in these um, in these strike breaking efforts in Harlan County and then up in Newport in Kentucky. And he came in seemingly really enjoying the notion of riding up on his horse behind uh, somebody who's a striker and hitting them over the head really hard with the butt of his revolver. Um, he, he took pleasure, it would seem, in the excessive force that he was using in these communities, while at the same time, they served the political and economic interests of, of a powerful few. And so he was, that's why he picked up the nickname of the most hated man in Kentucky, because the common people didn't stand a chance against this guy. He didn't, he could do anything with impunity. He had all of the political and economic backing. And and so in tanks, I mean, it's hard to imagine in Newport, Kentucky, tanks rolled. They had these, the Kentucky National Guard brought in tanks. They were they were wrapping people over the head. They were they were crushing skulls at the drop of a hat. Uh, and so I think that's I think that's the beginning of the I can do anything. I'm I'm this powerful. Look how mighty I am. And I, I think that's eventually what led him to push a woman down an elevator and and to kill my my grandmother's first cousin Verna. I think it was all tied in that to that that the, the way that narcissist sociopath social pathology works. It usually starts small with like animals, right? They always talk about that, and then it starts working up to vulnerable people. Um, and I think that's exactly what happened. What was it that got you on the road to? not only research, but to also write a black knight for the black bluegrass bell. I mean, you, you, I know it's a little bit of a tongue twister. It, it is. I mean, you've been coast to coast AM. You've, you've been in broadcasting for so long. So why was now the right time? Well, I've always been interested in justice. I, my first book, How to Pray When You're Pissed at God, was focused on divine justice. It really was. It was just, I, I think it's fair for people to demand and to have their voice heard, which ties into my love of communication and, and doing talk radio. It, it's giving alternative voices a chance to be heard. And that was, that was very much behind the, the theology of, of how to pray when you're pissed at God, is helping people find that voice. True crime is something I've been studying since I went to get my PhD, and I w I've been very interested in it because it is also an organ for people who are uh, voiceless victims. Uh, and true crime has always been a way to tell the story of people who had been murdered and why they mattered and to help get justice from the grave. And, and so I was very interested from that standpoint. And the more I started to study it, the more I thought about perhaps writing a true crime book. And that led me to say, well, what, what about the true crime that happened in my family? Well, we'll start there. I've heard the story my whole life. My mother had collected stories relating to Verna for a very long time, so I had a bit of a head start. And then by coincidence, Bob, they, they, had, uh, they had found the transcripts for these trials related to Verna Gar. Uh, they found the transcripts for the first time in 79 years. They found they were they were turned over to Filson Historical Society from the uh, from the Barry family in Henry County who had him in the basement. So it just said this needs to be written. It needs to be written right, and it needs to be written from a standpoint that gives Verna a voice, which is what I did. That's why I didn't write it as as definitive history. I wrote it as true crime to release really for her. For those of us who may not know, what exactly is true crime? Is it journalism? Is it fiction? Is it what is it? it you you hit you you kind of hit it. It's journalism, in it per se. It's it's a nonfiction narrative, told with the storytelling techniques of fiction. So true crime should never be fiction. It isn't fiction properly. Uh, true crime are are real stories, usually of murder, but they don't have to be, um, and they're nonfiction murder narratives that are told in the way that we usually tell a, a, a fictional story. So it's not journalism per se, because journalism puts the most important facts up 
top, right? We have the inverted pyramid of importance. And then, so it's always the who, what, where, why, and how at the, right out of the box. And you, and then the further you go into the story, the more detail you get. And true crime is really the other way around. It gives you great detail and background. And we start to learn about the people long before we, we really understand what happened. We're introduced to a whole nother world. And, and that's the, that's the way that fictional stories are told. Um, you would never start you know, imagine if you had Jaws, the movie, and you put all the facts up front <laughs> the first 10 minutes. What would be the point in watching the movie, right? So that's that's what true crime is like. It it takes its time with the story. And it's also it – ha it has an element of parable to it. And I, this certainly does in, in the case of A Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell is it, it, it maintains a moral position. It attempts to explain – a, a an important aspect of who we are as people. It, it sort of allows the the dead to pass along important lessons to the living, and that's not what journalism is supposed to do, and it doesn't. But true crime does it, and it does it very well. Mm -hmm. When I was reading your book, as I got more in depth with it, especially with Dan Hart, you know, as a comic book fan, I just kept seeing right. him as a huge supervillain. Yeah. Is that the way yeah, you were envisioning him as you was writing about this, that he was just a huge, he could have been a supervillain in a comic book? Well, he had this sort of Lex Luthor kind of feel to him, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. You know, he even kind of looks like Lex Luthor, the shaved head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, he was, uh, he was larger than life. And, and that's, that's part of what went over that, that rather unsophisticated jury. That and the fact that in that first jury, they were they were so dependent the the prosecution was so dependent on the crime science which was too new it was too early in the development of crime science and it it, it completely confused the jury it was a mistake i think on the part of the prosecutors to crutch so much on the crime science um but yeah so it there was a there's an aspect to that they they the jury ate up his larger than life persona, which definitely has this sort of comic book feel to it. For Verna Gar Taylor, I know her brothers took care of the situation, but was there also another individual in her life that could have been seen as a hero of sorts that at one time or another stepped in to try and keep her from being involved with Dan Hart? Well, there were, there were, well, I'll tell you, there's one person who tried to stop the relationship was my grandfather. Um, and he was a former um, police detective in Louisville. My, my grandfather had some trouble, so he was kind of a former a lot of things. But he was a former police detective. And at one point, um, Verna's family came to my grandfather and, and asked him, um, look, we're hearing a lot of stories about this guy, Denhart. We don't think he's treating Verna particularly well, but she seems to like him. What do you think? Can you tell us the real story? And he investigated Den Hart using his channels, and he came back and he he told the family, you know, tell her to get away from him. He's a foul ball. And and I think unfortunately that's probably part of what led to her breakup with Den Hart that night was an attempt to get away from him. She thought she'd do it publicly in a place where it was going to be safe and some place where he could, you know, if he got his mat on that, that she'd be able to just kind of sweet talk him out of it. She was a good Southern woman and she was, she was just going to try and, you know, rub his hand and just say, you know, it's going to be okay. And, and it just, it didn't work. And, and so there were people that, that saw the writing on the wall on this, even some of the women that worked in the laundry were worried about it. Um, and then there was another individual who unfortunately got roped into it in the trial. You know, so much of what ends up becoming part of the legend of this, of this murder in the state of Kentucky uh, in, involves things that the defense made up. And they met up, they kind of made up this whole relationship with this guy named Chester Wolfuck. Um, and, uh, and chess was just, um, he was implicated in the story. He didn't do anything, but it, it sure made it, it sure added to the intrigue that the defense needed to try to convince the jury that this couldn't have been Denhart. Mm -hmm. What was that last name? Wolfuck. 
as in wool, and then folk, F-O-L-K. And what's interesting about Chester Wolfock is he, he was a complete innocent. I don't even know. I mean, I have part of me thinks he may even have been on like the Asperger's spectrum because he's he won't look people in the eye. He doesn't like to talk, doesn't like to have conversations, but he just adored Verna. And he was her driver. And he came from one of the wealthiest people in town. And I only tell you this because it has this great historical interest. His first cousin was D.W. Griffith. Mm. Uh, Birth of a Nation. And Griffith was from just outside LaGrange. And um, and so D.W. Griffith came to the murder trial of uh, of Doc, Roy, and Jack. And D.W. Griffith wanted to make a movie about the Verna story. And that was 1937. And the family said, thank you, but no thank you. And and that was it. He never made another movie again and died a little long, little way, little ways after that. Mm. The reason why I was asking you to repeat the last name, because I was going to try and attempt it. But after words, I was like, you know what? I'm going to end up cussing. I just know it because my southern knees, as I call it. Yeah. Well, see, right. It all depends on where you're from. So like if you're when I lived in Nashville, I learned that a lot of people in Nashville say Nashville or even even stress the veal part a little bit, Nashville, but people outside of Nashville often swallow the veal and it was Nashville. And so same thing with Clarksville, you know, and everything. And, and so it kind of depended on where you were in your Southern accent. You could almost tell where they were in relationship to the city. Same thing about Louisville. My mom would never let me, and we were never allowed to ever say Louisville. And really? So we, Oh no, my God! She would step on our feet if we said that. So it's it had to be Louisville, and there's still a debate in the city of Louisville as to exactly how you pronounce Louisville, <laughs> depending on who you ask. Yeah, I don't know if you remember your time here in Tennessee, but there's a Lafayette, and oh, yeah. uh, you, you can either pronounce it Lafayette or Lafayette. It's Lafayette. Oh, I had I learned all sorts of pronunciations. I had to get used to that Demumbrian and a couple other things later on that I learned. No matter where I was, there was always something that was being pronounced differently. And uh, yeah, I was just thinking about that the other day because it's still Lafayette, Georgia, but Lafayette, Indiana. (laughs) And so, uh, yeah, there was tons. I loved my – what do you mean do I remember? I still keep in touch with my old partner, the Duke. Yes. uh, 103 KDF and Duke and I still chat from time to time. I just texted him a little while ago. And, uh, and I, I, I still have the only tattoo on my body says go Vols. Mm. So I just, you know, I think actually one of your former partners in Nashville is now the voice for the Tennessee Titans radio, right? That's the Duke. That's oh, okay. Mike. Yeah. So, yeah. So Mike, we just call him the Duke, the, the thin white Duke of news. Um, he, uh, uh, Mike is yes, yeah, still with the Titans and great guy. I love working with him. Those are great times. He was very funny. Let's talk about a little bit about how to pray when you're pissed at God. When you first wrote that, was it about your issue with tinnitus? Oh, yeah, no. Although certainly, you know, the the tinnitus piece comes into it in the sense that, I more than anything else, that's what was keeping me up at night. So I I decided I might as well do something with my time. So I thought might as well write. And, uh, and since I couldn't sleep because of this ringing in my head, I, I still, it, it goes on to this day and it, it'll never get better. I can only change the circumstances a little bit. And that, that, that has definitely improved. You know, my, that was experience was driven by going back to seminary and being ordained and working a lot with people in hospitals who were, just in a bad way. And they just, they, they, I heard so many times of people saying, don't even bother chaplain coming in here. I can't pray. I'm just so pissed at God right now. And I thought, well, that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is take those pissed off prayers right to God. I mean, who do we think we're fooling? If we believe in an omniscient God, do we think God doesn't know that's the way we're feeling? So you might as well get it out of your system. And certainly the Bible believed in that. So many of the prayers in the Bible are very angry. And and when, that's what I that's what I did. I wrote that book from that. And it's going to be part of a trilogy. I think I'm already looking at my next book, which is about um, a crime that was committed online um, and almost a kind of cyber murder. And I think so – I think that's how I'm going to wrap up my my justice trilogy, a book about divine justice, 
a book about earthly justice and a book about cyber justice. Mm, interesting, interesting. Uh, let me take a look here. I'm just thinking, I, I'm flipping through the pages of my mind. I'm a little bit slow at doing that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if I had the pages in my mind, it'd all look like a coloring book or something you put stickers <laughs> on. Oh, man. No, I, I, I know you said it wasn't about anything with you, but have you ever been pissed off at God and, and you just couldn't sure. find the time to pray, but you finally buried yourself into your beliefs and went to God? Well, see, that's the thing. I think they're two of the same. And I, I think that that's what the Psalms tell us is that so many of the Psalms are very angry. All of the prayers in How to Pray When You're Pissed at God are based on Psalms. Um, and the, 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 these deprecatory Psalms are the, the angriest Psalms in the Bible. And these are people who really believe that God's not doing God's job. And that's why, you know, the prayers are sort of like, hey, God, get with it. What's happening here? And I think there, there were times, and very specifically when my oldest brother was very close to death, and I, I found that very disorienting. I still do. I can't think about it and, and not cry mm -hmm. because he was such, he was so good to me. And I just couldn't imagine how that was in any way justice. You know, I was just some, you know, punk college kid, but my brother, he had done good things. He was already, he was already, he had already proven himself. And how could something so bad, like a kind of cancer get to him and why was I spared that it just didn't make any sense and so that's really where I I learned early on that I, I just had to pray through that I just had to always if I really believed and I had a dialogue with God then I wasn't going to have a fake one and I just I was there were times when I just I screamed right up to the heavens and and ask why and I don't always get an answer but I think that's what all of us should do there's never a time when we can't take what we're really thinking about and, and put it out there in prayer. So true. So true. Um, you, you know, I, I actually get asked quite often. I, I went to my wife and I went to rooms to go to pick up some furniture and I got into a discussion about what I do. And an individual asked me how a person could be a Christian and still believe in the paranormal, how those two yeah. can coincide. What do you think? Oh, it, it, because what isn't paranormal about the Bible? I mean, there's so many really cool things that happen in the Bible stories, things that we don't even talk about. I mean, we could just, you go with Ezekiel saw the wheel and whatever, but there's tons of things where really it's the story in the Bible of people grappling with things they don't understand. And, and however we look at that, we just say it's stories of people who are trying to understand their relationship with God. How does the universe work? What's the relationship with evil? And I think these are the core questions that still plague us today. I just think the difference is I don't build a belief system around the paranormal. The paranormal, I'll, you know, I've always said this, that there's things that I believe in that I'll put my faith in, and there's things I'll think about. And I'll think about a lot of stuff. I have no fear of thinking about things. But I reserve a space, a very small space, for the things that I believe in, the things that I'll put my faith in. Um, and the rest of the world and the rest of any subject that people bring up, it's just stuff to think about. I'm watching this Netflix series right now on the history of hip hop. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated. <laughs> it's like I never knew any of this. Or I knew some of it, the stuff that had broken through to mainstream culture. But that's what I'm talking about. I love learning and finding out completely different experiences that other people were having. And on top of that, I saw a UFO once and it, it made a big impression on me. And if I, I, all I can say is I saw it. I, I can't tell you, I believe that aliens are here to look after us. I don't, it doesn't change my theology, but it, I'll never forget it. <laughs> and I know I saw it and I wasn't, you know, I don't drink. So I know I wasn't drunk and I don't take drugs. So whatever it was, it was real. It was just really weird. There's another thing I want to touch on with you. I've, I've always wondered about this, especially as I've been doing this show. I've had on gentlemen like uh, Dr. Amit Goswami, and he will actually be on very soon. 
cool. a, a theoretical physicist. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not. I, 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 I've seen his name bandied about. Yeah, I, yeah. I haven't looked forward to hearing that. Carl Coleman and some other individuals, and they've spoken about how our world, the world around us, even Dr. Michio Kaku, that nothing is physical. We are a holographic illusion. Everything around us is made up of nothing but pure energy. What is your belief in that? For me, if it's true, then life is just an es educational institution for souls, and we are here to learn whatever it is before we reach that next level. Well, I think these are things which, here, I what I would t tell you is that let's hold everything in tension with something else. We never have to cling to just one pole. So to, to your point, when I was in college, and some people may object to this characterization, so let me apologize way up front. I'm not, I'm not impersonating somebody to mock them or to mock a particular ethnic group, but I can't tell the story without trying to recapture the way this guy said it. I had physics with a professor who had written the, uh, the, the section on particle physics in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Very smart guy. And he was from South Korea. And he would get very animated whenever he would talk about matter. And it was never an issue of trying to make it sound like we didn't matter, but rather how tied are we with the rest of the world. And what he would say, and I'll say it in just the way he said it, is he would say, ever than a wave, ever than a wave, you a wave, I'm a wave, this table, it a wave, ever in a wave. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. That is exactly how it, ever in a wave. Uh, tree, it a wave. Window, it a wave. Everything a wave. And, and that's one way to look at it. It's particles and waves. So do we just think of it that way? Or do we think maybe this is part of what, we, in a way, we've always sensed is that we're all connected, and we all, we all, we are all part of the same substance in a way, and we can think of that, I think, in a very divine way. We sh we share a soul, and and it doesn't mean that the table has a soul, but it just means that that we we exist in life for a period of time, and we can do with the energy that we're given only so much. The rabbis say, everybody is going to be a role model. The only thing we have to say about it is whether we're going to be a positive one or a negative one. I say, I'm a wave, you a wave, everyone a wave. Let's be good waves. Let's be waves for good. How about a tidal wave? <laughs> well, that's this show. <laughs> You're a tidal wave on in your podcast is a tidal wave. Uh, I'll tell you, during the show, sometimes it's very difficult because – this time of the year, I have throat issues like I've discussed before with you and on this show, but also have TMJ. And sometimes my jaw just completely locks up. This happened when I was like 19 years old. I was driving around where I was working at an aluminum plant at, I think it was at midnight. I was going to load up a truck and around the very back of the building, they were, there were some punks, whatever, having a party. My window was rolled down and one of them just punched me right through my car window. Now, luckily, it was rolled down. Otherwise, <laughs> you never yeah. know what would happen. As soon as I was punched, I saw nothing but, I mean, this was midnight we're talking about. I saw right. a flash of light, bright white light. That's all I saw. And ever since then, I've had trouble with my jaw. But I will tell you, I love doing this show. I love having on individuals such as yourself, regardless of how much trouble it's causing. I mean, you know this, having tendonitis, you dealt with that for years before you decided enough was enough. Well, I did, yeah, the doctors told me, it's, how vain are you? Can you live a life without being on the radio? And I said, yep. And they said, good, because if you keep going, you'll be deaf. And I was like, nope, don't want that. So mm. that was answered for me. But in that, in that same way that you're talking about there, think about that. How many people, I mean, you, so I, I hate the discomfort of that thought for you and how binding that must feel. But it should also be a reminder to all of us that we should never take for granted our ability to speak and to eat and that it still is a miracle how our bodies are formed and the fact that we can use our mouths to both express ourselves and maybe sometimes 
we should all be more mindful of the words we use in the time we talk. Mm -hmm. And for me, it goes back to how to pray when you're pissed off at God. I mean, sometimes I get so pissed off that, you know, my jaw's in the shape of it. Sure, I could go to the hospital. I could go get a surgery or whatever. But most of the emails I get are great. Some people will say, hey, you can't pronounce this right. I'm like, no shit, Sherlock. Guess what? <laughs> I, I mean, really, I send back emails and say, no shit, hey. Sherlock. <laughs> no. Hey, you nailed that. You nailed the doctor. I was really impressed by that. I got Swami or whatever. I thought, that's good. You can't, uh, let's try, try, other people try and take a, sh a shot at that. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, that is the funny thing. And, and I think that's kind of the beauty about, in a way, about doing radio for as long as I did is I, I also, you also kind of learn to be a little bit bulletproof. And it, people, the, the same sort of bullying that goes on in kind of the casual basis of the way people mock each other, take your best shot. I don't care. <laughs> you know, I really, I get in trouble on my Facebook page because I just, people try and shame me for one thing or another. And oh my God, I just, I look at that and just think that's ridiculous. That must work on somebody because you've taught yourself to do it, but it sure as hell doesn't work on me. So you know, it's a big internet. You'll find somebody else who fall for that, but not here. Yeah, hell, you get in trouble on your Twitter account. I haven't been noticing that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I don't care about that either. <laughs> you know, I just don't. I, it's not for me. This is a place to express myself, and I feel like saying something on Twitter or Facebook. I, I don't ask for somebody else's permission. I'm not putting it up for a vote. And if you don't like it, def, you know, unfriend me. I don't care. I'm not here to try and keep if I try if, we, if anybody any of us did that anybody tries to live by that rule of trying to be popular with everybody oh my god you talk about a sickness it'll drive you nuts it certainly would yes you'll never sleep again and ladies and gentlemen Ian's book is a black knight for the bluegrass bell the murder of Verna Gar Taylor and the Kentucky honor code killing that gave her justice Ian that's a really long title well, the subtitles are there just because sometimes people don't get enough from the title. So that okay. was one, one of those one of those publisher things. So the title is really just Black Knight for the Bluegrass Bell, but we put a couple other words up there so people could follow along. Plus it makes those photos on the cover make more sense, you know, which are cool cover photos. And if anybody wants it, if it's time for the holidays, and I hope they do order it for somebody, I think the fastest way now is to go through. I'm trying to save myself some Twitter or Facebook responses, if you don't mind, and, and to go directly through the publisher. Uh, there are a lot of bookstores in Kentucky, all of the Barnes and Noble uh, locations in Kentucky have it on displays, maybe North Tennessee, but I don't know that. And, um, uh, and then Online, barnesandnoble.com was selling out pretty regularly. Amazon was selling out pretty regularly. And so I think the fastest way is just get it through acclaimpress.com. And they get them, they get the books out pretty quickly. And if, if it's close to Christmas and people wanted to get it to somebody for a Christmas present, they can do Express and you can get it there. It'll cost you a little extra. But it's a good book, don't you think? It's worth the read. It certainly is, yes. I know you've been doing some signings. Are you done with that now or are you still doing it? Well, I just signed one about uh, an hour and a half ago, but that was just somebody I bumped into. So, uh, no, nah, I'm not. I, I've I've got. A, I had a semester here. I have to wrap up. I got to get my my grades in for uh, the fall for the kids who took my courses, and then I'm working on syllabi for next semester. So, yeah, I I, I don't have anything scheduled. I did a bunch. They were fun. Uh, but for me, it's just all about talking to people like you. I think that's. I think that's more fun than than going out and sitting in a bookstore somewhere mm -hmm. so thanks for for letting me come on and and if people can get the book at acclaimpress.com i'd be very grateful yes and it's definitely great to have you here ian if, you're, if you're ever in nashville just let me know i'd like to meet you personally and take you I'll out to dinner or something else i'm in i'm long overdue to reconnect with my friend demetria Kaladimos. Um, Demetri and I went to undergrad to go. Well, she was in graduate school. I was undergrad when we used to hang out in college. And, uh, so we, we got to be close again when I lived there and it would be good to see her again too. So I, and, and the Duke, of course, my old partner, Mike Donegan, the voice of the Tennessee Titans. So yeah, there's lots of reasons. And Bob, I would love to do that too. We'll, we'll go, we'll go hang out somewhere. I promise. Hey, maybe we can go to a, uh, if you're not opposed to it, maybe we can go do a ghost hunting tour or something. Uh <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not opposed to anything. That'd be fun. There's, I'm sure there's good ones around. 
and uh, and you'll know the better ones. So thanks thanks for that thought. I think that'd be fun. Oh yeah, and uh, we can record it. We can do a Ian Punnett and Bob Bain uh, Paranormal oh. Hour video okay. thing. <laughs> well, actually, you lead the way. I'll be right behind you. I'll, <laughs> uh, well, I'll Ian, have a flashlight. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> and if anything hops out at me, I'm sure you'll be far behind. You'll be whoo. Uh I'll be broadcasting. I'll be talking about what's happening. Well, I don't know what this creature is, but it's got a hold of Bob's foot right now, and we'll be right back after this. <laughs> oh, damn. It's dragging him off. I better run. <laughs> I will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for letting me on. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Ian Punnett. And uh, what a great time we had here together. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I have. Uh, if you're interested in his book, go to acclaimpress.com or mysteriousmatters.com slash black knight. Well, folks, until the next time we do come back together again, I wish you all a kind farewell. Farewell.